<laughs> Can you say hi, everybody? Hi, everybody. Can you hi. say that, Mom? Yes. Say it. Need to say something else. Yeah, we need to tell these guys to hush. Hey. <laughs> We're adding color. To <laughs> Why? Yeah. It makes you seem like you're someplace. Yeah. There, there's something. <laughs> Okay, welcome to Victoria Knits. I'm Victoria. I'm, I'm, I'm Russell. Yes, you are. And who's that? Who am I? Mommy. <laughs> but what's my name? Vanessa. Very good, good job. Russell. Very good. Vanessa Hendricks. Right. And I'm, and I'm Hendricks. You're a Hendricks also, aren't you? Do you are? No. <laughs> It's been a while. We're, you're married. We're a little yes. rusty here, but we're, you're uh, married we're doing to our Poopa. best. Yes, I am married to Poopa. That's right. Russell, have you ever seen a snowflake this big? Yeah. <laughs> um, 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 that's mine. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, when I was doing my Montana facts, in Vlogmas, I forgot this one. In 1887, I believe it was. Which, which one is yep, mine? 1887 though? in January in Fort Keogh, Montana, they recorded. Elburn, um, help me make that. Really? Well, I made this one, but I bet Russell made another snowflake, huh? Yeah. They recorded a snowflake that was 15 inches across. Wow, that I know. is big. Can you believe it? Yeah. I can't. <laughs> I have a hard time believing that. I Who wouldn't love to see a snowflake this big? Now, they do say there are plenty of snowflakes measured at like two inches, three inches across, but they Can say I? this is possible. They say this is possible because what happens is wind forces the, the falling snow together, and together they can make a big snowflake. But many people at Fort Keogh uh, reportedly saw 15 inch snowflakes falling. That would be something to see, wouldn't it? Oh. What? <laughs> so I had my, uh, hopefully my final surgery done um, on Monday on my face. Um, I'm not sure how much I want to talk about it. I've talked about it and talked about it. I'm tired of talking about it. Don't forget it. Stop hurting. What? Stop her teen? Okay. Not sure what that's about. Oh, and I want to thank Aquila from uh, the Lefty Knitter podcast. She sent me a big, big box of um, items. That was so nice of her. I don't know how people manage it, but she keeps, you know, she and other I'm people I've good. seen have kept track of their leftover minis so they can write down exactly what they're sending you, which is fantastic, and I think that's just the best. She also knows Russell very well, and what did she send, Russell? Suckers. Suckers, she sent suckers, didn't she? You've already had two of them. You had the, the Mickey Mouse first, didn't you? Yeah. That was really good, wasn't it? After breakfast, I bet your mommy will let you have another one. You can have one now. Okay. Which one do you want? Pink one. Okay. <laughs> I, pink one. I really wanted to thank Aquila for that package. It was really, really sweet of her. This camera keeps getting moved. Okay. So, yeah, a little bit of a rough start to this podcast, but that's that's to be expected. It's been a while. Um, so, I... Uh, I went on a uh, day trip with my friend uh, Janet, and we went to um, we went and did a lot of things together. And that's what I'm going to show you next. What color is it? <laughs> you don't have to whisper. Russell. What color do you think it is? Um. I 
I can think about it. Okay, you can think about it. All right. Can you say bye-bye for now? Bye-bye. <laughs> can you say thank you for watching? Thank you for watching. <laughs> well, the first thing Janet and I did was visit this yarn shop called Old Sun Knits. It's owned by Lisa Aiken. It was really pretty inside. She had a lot of great looking yarn, which we really enjoyed looking around at. I should have taken some pictures with Lisa, but I got distracted by her dog. <laughs> this beautiful yellow lab <laughs> was so friendly. It's her dog. Um, she said it provides great customer service. He provides great customer service. <laughs> he sure was sweet. Ooh, yeah, look at you. Just, you got to say, that's funny. Yeah. What brings you guys by? Yarn. Yarn. Oh, it's not that. Yeah, so yarn brings us by. Oh, wow. I see your ad. Um, go local? Might have been. Is it one of the places it's in? Might have been. I did make one purchase there, which um, I'll show you that when I use it in something I'm going to knit. And then Janet and I decided to hike on the Whitefish Trail. I didn't even know this trail existed. We went to the uh, Lion Mountain Loop, and it goes up to... Um, Skiles Lake Overlook, which was really, really pretty. We weren't sure if we were going to need snowshoes or not. We would have if there hadn't been so many people who had uh, tramped the snow down plenty, so our hiking shoes uh, did the job. So it was great. It was a lot of fun. It was a great day for a hike. It's really pretty up there. Afterwards, Janet and I went and had lunch together and we visited a bookstore. It was a really nice day out that I really needed. So let's talk about some knitting. I finished this shawl. It's called The Ridge by Jean Benkin Draper. I knit it as a sample for Cappy whose shop used to be called The Yarn and I, but now she has changed it to The Yarn and Us in order to include her husband, Brian. The, uh, uh, Cappy sent me the, the yarns that are used in this, and they are Plumeria Lay is the multicolored one, and the solid pink is called Wild Orchid. And you can check, check out Cappy's shop. Uh, she's on Yetsy as The Yarn and Us. I did like, I liked this shawl and I, um, I enjoyed the pattern. My only, um, the only uh, critique I have of it is that when someone talks about short rows on a pattern and then does not tell you to wrap and turn, yeah, I have a problem with that. And that was my, my only downfall here. He never said wrap and turn, he just said turn, and I assumed he was going to adjust for that afterwards, and he did not. So, um, but I think it turned out pretty well. I was happy with it, and so was Cappy. Hi, we're going to see if this works. I know there's some background music here. Kim and I are at a coffee shop. I think it's called Wild Coffee Company. <laughs> That's their coffee cup I got.
I just finished having the stitches taken out of my mouth. It's still really sore. Um, and he's going to allow the top part that he cut into to heal on its own without stitches. It's called granulation wound. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still drinking with a straw. It's a little, it's a little tough to maneuver this part. I did want to mention, you saw Janet and I take that hike. Um, I have to tell you something about Janet. Janet is one of the sweetest people. She's really, really kind. When we um, just about hit, got to the trailhead, she dr was driving and we saw a young man, his vehicle, his, uh, it was some kind of company vehicle was stuck in the snow. She stopped to ask if she could help and he was stuck really badly. And she said, well, do you have a shovel? And he says, no, I don't. And she says, well, I have one and you can have it. And she had a fold up snow shovel and she handed it to him and she says, well, if you're still here, when we leave, when we finish our hike, I'll get it from you. If not, don't worry about it. That was really, really nice of her. We went up, we did our hike, we came back and the snow shovel was propped against her car. <laughs> super nice. So I'm sitting here knitting and I'm working on um, the February hat that's by Kate Gagnon Osborne. It's a free pattern on Ravelry and I will put across the bottom the yarn I'm using. Now this is the second, the second one I've done. The first one, I'll put a picture in here, and I knit this for my fr our friend Britt. He just had, um, see if I can get it right, pectus excavatum surgery. Janet knows the proper way to pronounce all that. <laughs> and I thought it would be nice to send him a little something. So I did send him that finished hat, and I really liked the way it turned out, and so I thought uh, it'd be nice to make one for Kim. So that's what I'm working on. Does everybody else uh, kind of give a little shudder when they say this takes a provisional cast on? The first hat I knit for Brit worked out really well. I didn't have any problems with it. The second time I tried it, I, I rip, had to rip the entire brim out. So I'm going to be much more careful with this one, but I think it'll be okay. The other thing I didn't bring with me that I'd like to show you is this. Um, cowl I knit for my daughter. It was kind of for Christmas. I gave it to her after Christmas. Didn't take very long to knit. I think it was maybe two or three days. It's called Paris in Berlin and it's by Hohi Locatelli. And I'll put across the bottom uh, what yarn I used for that too. I think it turned out really pretty and I think um, this, uh, that green yarn of Cappy's is just gorgeous. I really like it and my daughter really likes it too. So Kim and I are spending a little time here having some coffee and then we're going to head up to another section of the Whitefish Trail today and do a hike together. And I am um, planning on finish up, finishing up my podcast up there. I will tell you that when uh, the doctor cut this out a week ago, he had to um, do three attempts to get it all. Not because it was deep, but because it was wide and it took him a while to get all the edges out of there. He said it would have been good to um, or, it, you know, the mouth, my inside of my mouth could have used some stitches, but um, he knows how annoying those are. <clears throat> so he said he prefers to try not to use stitches on your mouth, if he, in the inside of your mouth. So he said, we'll, uh, we'll try to let that heal up on its own because, you know, lips and, and mouths usually heal up pretty quickly. So yeah, it's still an annoyance, um, but <laughs> what are you gonna do, right? <laughs> Six months from now, it'll be nothing. <laughs> All right, so I hope I um, plan on seeing you on the trail in a little bit. <laughs>
we made it to Smith Lake. <laughs> we started at the um, Swift Creek Trailhead, which is part of the Whitefish Trail, which I, like I said, I had never heard of before. The Whitefish Trail consists of 12 trailheads and 42 plus miles of natural surface trail comprised of stacked loops, scenic overlooks, single track trails, and gated logging roads. It's the gateway for hikers, bikers, runners, skiers, and equestrians to beautiful forests, prime wildlife habitat, sweeping vistas, pristine lakes, and interconnected recreation areas. And this was established in 2010, these, um, the Whitefish Trail. <clears throat> so, as I said, we just reached Smith Lake, and it's a little bit of a, um, what would you say? <laughs> a little bit. Underwhelming. <laughs> underwhelming, thank you. That is the word, underwhelming. There's somebody out there ice fishing. It's obviously frozen over. I was excited on the way here because I thought, oh, the sky's blue and we're going to see a really pretty lake once we get there. It, you know, no, it's frozen over and it's covered with ice and snow. It was, it's two and a half miles to this point. And yeah, it's a, it was a, it was a, it was a hike, wasn't it, honey? It was, it was a hike. I did want to mention when I was talking about that Paris in Berlin by Hohi Locatelli, the cowl I, I made for my daughter that I showed you, um, it's supposed to take one full skein of fingering yarn. I ran out of yarn on that, and that's probably because I'm such a loose knitter. So lucky for me, I had an extra skein of that yarn by Cappy, that beautiful green yarn, and I just had to use it to, to cast off, but just FYI. I also forgot to mention that I first saw that cowl pattern on the podcast MC Knitting Adventures with Colleen and May. And if you haven't checked them out, I recommend you do. Um, they podcast, they live in Canada, but they do a lot of uh, what they call knitting adventures and it's, it's really fun to watch. Okay, on to some more things. I did bring some knitting with me. And yeah, this was a... This was a, a difficult hike for me. I haven't been out a lot lately, and this had a lot of hills in it, but, you know, I needed it, so that's good. <clears throat> so, I was gifted this pattern, and it is the Olive and Jack Hat by Sarah Stevens. And I was gifted it from Sylvia, Rose Cartage Garden. Hi, Sylvia. Thank you so much. So why are your hats so tricky to knit? Do you guys have a problem with them? I sure do. I have a problem getting them to be the proper size. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this was my third attempt. And for this one, I cast on 112 stitches on size four needle, and I went to size six for the body. And I like it, I like it a lot. The yarn is Little Fox Yarn, Volpine DK. And it was a skein of yarn I won from Jenny of Lucky Jenny Knits. Remember Jenny? She had that Lucky Jenny Knits podcast, which she quit a while back just because she was too busy. And I get that. She's, she works. She has children. It's tough. And Candy of Paws for Stitches. I won this from those two. They were doing a giveaway. Candy also quit her podcast. So I on this one, I just worked three repeats because I didn't want a slouchy hat and I finished it in two days and um, why don't I put it on for you what the heck I've already got hat hair so it, it won't matter right I like it it's a little bit loose it would fit nice and tight if I had um, if I kept one of my uh, my little ear wraps under it but I like it it's fine it's and I, this yarn. This yarn was just gorgeous to work with. Really soft and really, really pretty. Really nice yarn. I like that a lot. And I like that hat so much. I made another one. <laughs> this one I used um, uh, Uru yarn sugared worsted in the Wolves colorway. I got this yarn from Knit Crate. And this time I modified it a little bit. I made the brim uh, quite a bit uh, deeper so it would uh, 
turn up around my ears and I like that I like that style too I love this yarn you know I love this yarn so much I tried to buy more of it when I got it from Knit Crate because I thought it was so pretty but I couldn't I couldn't find any more of it which I was really bummed about but anyway <laughs> I use the same size needles on this one um, but I did three and a half inches of ribbing Oh no, I did switch to size five for the body on this one instead of six. So I actually uh, did a smaller needle size, even though it was worsted weight. I wanted it a little tighter, but this works. I liked it a lot. So I made a cowl to match <laughs> and I can't get the cowl on because I've got my uh, microphone on, but there's the cowl. This cowl is called Tom's Crossed Cowl by Melissa Beach. It's a free pattern on Ravelry. I used that same yarn because, you know, Knit Crate, they send you two skeins. So the one thing I did different on this one was I did one extra pattern repeat because I wanted it to really um, keep me warm around my neck and I thought uh, that would help. I also did a knit one through the back loop, purl one ribbing on the bottom, for two inches instead of as the pattern calls for, which is a really short ribbing, which I did on top, but I realized that was gonna curl. So I went for the longer ribbing on the bottom. And I really like this too. It makes a nice set, doesn't it? <laughs> I wished I had one more skein, I would have done a pair of mittens. I didn't have enough left over for mittens, but I really like these. And the one other thing I, I'm just going to keep this on. The one other thing I uh, have been working on, and I got one sock done, is this um, Blaze sock by Jan Swarbrick. This is a new pattern, and she is she has asked me if I'd be interested in test knitting it. I said, of course I would. Can you see it well enough? Okay. Um, I have to admit, on Jan's patterns, I do not follow them exactly. I do, um, I do them toe up, which is not how she writes them. And I also do a, um, I put in a fish lips kiss heel because that's my preferred heel. So I really shouldn't say I'm test knitting this for Jan because it's kind of, kind of a test knit. Anyway, she also has you, uh, I didn't reduce the, um, stitches like she said I think this was a 56 stitch and I uh, figured that was about as low as I wanted to go for my foot so um, between the pattern on the sides I just did some knit rows and I think it works out really well I really like Jan's patterns I think this is these they're really pretty I think she does a great job I started this one in the doctor's office a week ago when I had my, my uh, surgery on my lip and that went fine. I started them while I was waiting. But then when I got home, I continued with them. And then after a while, I realized I had skipped um, two rows <laughs> because I don't know, you know, ibuprofen and Tylenol taken at the same time. <laughs> I was I was hurting and I, I just missed two rows. Um, you know, I shouldn't make excuses, but I don't think you can tell. I certainly can't tell. I think it looks great. I think the pattern still looks really nice. And uh, I'm really looking forward to them. Now the yarn, I should talk about the yarn. The yarn is Yakagani. You shouldn't even look at that word when you pronounce it, right? Yakagani. <laughs> and um, it's from Yakagani Yarns Mon Sock. And the colorway is Mr. Morgan. This was a gift from Katie. Hi, Katie. She is for sure on Ravelry. And I'm loving, loving this yarn. These are gonna be in addition to my Christmas box of socks because I was gifted this yarn at Christmas time. And that's, <laughs> that's what I'm using as an excuse to put them in my Christmas box of socks. I think they're gonna be really nice. I'm really looking forward to finishing those. We turned it around because the, the sun's bothering us. So um, I did wanna say Thank you to Allie from Little Drops of Wonderful. She had sent this M&S Christmas pudding and I ate it. I ate it plain. I know everybody said I should have put uh, a sauce on it, 
but um, I heated it up in the microwave per the instructions and it was delicious. It was so delicious. I ate the whole thing by myself. <laughs> I would say, and I've, I've always kind of wondered what Christmas pudding really is, and I would have to say it's kind of a cross between our American bread pudding and our fruitcake. Not as dense as fruitcake, but denser than bread pudding. Delicious. Really delicious. Thank you, Allie. I loved it. So, Kim and I are going to head back to the car, to the trailhead. We've got two and a half miles to go. It's going to take a little while. And then we have to drive back to Marion. Marion is about, Marion is 35 miles from Whitefish, uh, but we drove eight miles out of Whitefish to reach the trailhead. So I might show a few pictures on the way back, I might not, but what, regardless, what's coming up next is going to be an essay from this magazine, an essay by Chris, my friend Chris Latre. Now I'm going to insert a picture here of Chris. And uh, the magazine describes Chris Latre as, Chris Latre is an enrolled member of the Little Shell Tribe of Chippewa Indians. His book, One Sentence Journal, Short Poems and Essays from the World at Large, won the 2018 Montana Book Award and a 2019 High Plains Book Award. His next book will be published in spring 2021. So he was the featured writer on this in this magazine. <laughs> I act like he's my son or something. Very proud of, of Chris Latre. So what I wanted to say was, what's coming up is a very R-rated segment. I'm gonna, uh, I'll put down here the timestamp you should jump to if you don't wanna watch it because it does contain adult themes and adult language. And so if you have young children uh, in the room or you're not interested in this kind of thing, then I suggest you jump to uh, the timestamp I'm gonna put down here. And so uh, you will have, you can skip the whole thing if you want. I recorded this before I had my um, stitches done on my face because I knew this was coming up and I suspected it was gonna give me some trouble with my speech. It's certainly given me trouble with uh, eating and drinking a little bit, but it's getting much better as you can tell. So here's uh, Chris's essay. The wee hours, sitting in my chair in the living room. My dog Bucky, a two-year-old Jack Russell Terrier, is in the yard doing whatever it is she does out there when she gets me out of bed. Moonlight is spilling across the dry grass, the porch, and through the sliding glass door. I love nights like this, the phenomena of them, the way they call me to walk out into the darkness. I rarely do even though I will pay the price for my wakefulness tomorrow. I've been reading a book about Sasquatch in the Great Bear Rainforest of British Columbia. I spook myself imagining some gigantic form moving in the night outside, hunkered down out by the propane tank against the back fence. Its huge shadow obscuring the starlit sky as it stands to full height. That is something else I love. The notion that maybe, just maybe, these creatures could exist. People believe in wackier things, right? I choose Bigfoot. I want to visit that part of the world where tales of the Sasquatch abound, which extends from the Campbell River in British Columbia north all the way to Alaska. It is a wild, rainy, and primeval place with a rugged, storm-pounded coastline. Maybe when I burn my last bridge and my heart for community gives out, I'll disappear there instead, living out my days as a hermit. It's a fantasy I often indulge in. The reality is I'd probably end up dead at the hands of some meathead Canadian trophy hunter mistaking me for a bear. There are worse ways to go. It might even be a worse experience for the hunter. My cares would finally be over. 
he would have to live with himself. Then again, that person may not care after all. I shouldn't underestimate the moral turpitude of the run-of-the-mill trophy hunter. The Great Bear Rainforest is a magnificent place. At 12,000 square miles, 15.8 million acres, it is the largest temperate rainforest in the world. The area supports more organic matter per square meter than any other place anywhere on the planet. More biomass than the jungles in Africa or the Amazon. A cacophonous scrum that includes hundreds of different animal species, all clawing out their existence among thousands of different plants, crowded higgly-piggly together under a canopy of fir, spruce, and cedar trees. So much life and so much death. Death is as critical a part of the equation as anything. All that breeding and eating and more breeding and then the shitting and more eating and then breeding leads to an equal measure of death and decomposition. The rot, all its stink and filth and slimy grossness is critical to making life possible, from the tiniest species to the greatest. Decay is essential. Decay is the promise of life. The grossest thing I've ever seen in the woods was on a hike in Washington with my dog. Crossing an area where logging equipment was parked for the weekend, the ground churned up into deep ruts from all the comings and goings and my dog emerging from the woods, smacking his lips with a length of stained toilet paper still clinging to his muzzle, which goes a long way toward explaining why people who let their dogs lick their faces gross me out. Because lovable as they are, dogs are pretty damn gross. Do we put too high a value on life in the clinging to it? I have come to think so. I think about death, about dying, all the time. A French reference to orgasm, la petite mort, translates as the little death. Depending on who you ask, it refers to the loss of life force once thought to accompany the experience. Those folks could be on to something. Maybe when we get too old to fuck worth a damn, if at all, we're left to stop dreaming about sex and instead focus on the other ultimate intimate feature of life, the ending of it. Back to the mud. That's how the Northmen characters in the magnificent fantasy writings of English author Joe Abercrombie refer to death. When someone dies, they have gone back to the mud. For them, that usually means a battlefield of some kind, as they lead violent and generally short lives. Even though it's fantasy, I like the idea. Back to the mud. Returned to the earth. Quite possibly, the fallen remain right where they fell, decomposing, decaying back into the world or gathered by their comrades for disposal in a pyre of some kind, if not tumbled into a shallow grave, which ultimately serves the same purpose, as if they'd remained where they fell in the first place. Their corpses become part of the cycle of renewal that pretty much every other member of the biological community is part of, but humans. People can still be buried at sea, but going out on a blazing pyre, at least in the United States, is almost impossible to do legally. There is one place in Colorado, in the town of Crestone, where you can be consumed by flames reaching skyward. But they won't torch just anyone. You have to live in the neighboring community, a decision they wisely made to keep people from overrunning their town in a bid to have a novel funeral. It's quick and inexpensive, unlike just about anything else but a drive through meal these days, which is its own kind of end-of-life pursuit. Death, typically, is a big toxic moneymaker in the USA. Funerals are expensive. Coffins are expensive. 
All the chemicals used to preserve the body are expensive and nothing you'd want near you while you are alive. This has only been the case for maybe the last hundred years or so. Back in the day, if Grandma passed in her bed, her body would be dealt with by the family and likely laid to rest in the family plot out back. That can still happen here in Montana, but there are all kinds of laws and regulations one must follow. Most of us die with so many lingering obligations tied to us that the man needs to know what is going on and who those tendrils will be attached to among the living relatives of the deceased. We have our debts and our estates and all the shit we've accumulated over a lifetime that someone, probably grieving and not wanting to have to deal with it, has to resolve. I don't want any part of that. I don't want anyone to have to clean up my living messes after I die. I can't think of a worse thing to do to someone as my final act. There is a growing movement toward natural burials or green burials in America, but it's slow going, which isn't surprising. No industry that essentially prints its own money as the funeral industry does wants to see anything simplified. But the idea behind this kind of burial, besides lowering the staggering costs of a traditional burial, the, two th the 2016 national median cost of a funeral runs $7,500 to $8,500, depending on the options you choose, according to the National Funeral Directors Association, is to get the decomposition of human bodies back into the earth where it belongs, where it was meant to end up. I saw a CNN report in May 2019 with a lead of Washington has become the first state in the nation to pass a law allowing composting as an alternative to burial or cremation of human remains. The bill goes into effect in May of 2020. Think of how you take your coffee grounds and vegetable scraps, cover them with straw and wait for them to turn to soil. That's essentially how human composting works. A facility manages the remains, probably not a minimum wager in muck boots wielding a pitchfork to turn the pile, but who knows. And after a period of weeks, you receive a box of soil to take home, and if you choose, grow food or flowers in. That's an improvement over ashes in an urn, isn't it? Who wouldn't want to plant a grandpa tree, for example? It seems a little weird, but it also seems a hell of a lot better to me. Would I rather look at a cheap piece of ceramics on the mantle or sit in the shade of something grown in the remains of a loved one? It's a no-brainer. Why all this brain energy on death and dying? As I finish this essay, months after starting it, it is the evening of the fifth anniversary of my father's death. I write from the cusp of Halloween, Samhain, when the spirits of the dead are said to be closer to the living, the veil between worlds at its thinnest. I like the season, even with all its dark energy. I think of my father, who died in his sleep after a long illness, his body in decay from the inside out. Dying in one's sleep is maybe the best way to go, though I still think the poet Jim Harrison's death at his desk writing a poem might be the ultimate. And I like to think my father's letting go was gentle, maybe even happy. I lament what came after, my last sight of him being nothing more than a shape in a black bag being wheeled out of the family home on a gurney. Dad didn't want a funeral. He wanted to be cremated, and he was. So there is no graveside to visit. I don't know where his ashes are, presumably in an urn somewhere in my mom's house. The family home is owned by someone else now. All the pets buried there, beloved companions in earth belonging to strangers. Even the mill where dad gave more than 40 years of his life is slowly being dismantled with what remains of it slowly rotting into the ground, a toxic blight destined to become a Superfund site. Too often that is the kind of decay we humans leave in our wake. 
With each passing year, short of memories and some few photographs, it's like Dad wasn't ever here. There's nowhere to mark his presence. There's nowhere he loved enough to say he wanted his remains to reside. That, to me, is tragic, and I have yet to come to terms with it. Maybe I'm obsessed with death because I've lived so far beyond the natural expiration date for our species, but keep kicking around because of how science has extended my and everyone else's lifespan. Sometimes the thought of two or three more decades is more than I want to bear. Even one more decade, for that matter. Sometimes it eats at me, nights like this, months like this. I don't really look forward to anything, which is its own kind of decay, the loss of verve for living. I don't see much adventure ahead of me. My heart feels eternally broken, both existentially in how people have ruined the world and personally in my myriad failures to be anywhere near the kind of person I'd like to be. My petty yearnings and desires and lusts and heartaches and resentments and jealousies and regrets and everything and all in between. Surely others feel this way. Maybe we all do, but have been duped into thinking it is taboo to discuss it. That's what spirituality is for, to fool oneself into thinking it's all okay. But really it isn't. Life is more brutal than not, a vast existence of suffering occasionally pricked with just enough joy to make it all seem worthwhile. Life may occasionally flirt with being a gift, maybe sometimes for years at a time, if one is fortunate. But more often these days, I think life is overrated. So I think about death. What is next, if anything? How do I want to go out? Preferably like Harrison, pen in hand, with no electronic device anywhere near me. I hope not to have a bunch of bullshit to leave in my wake for the remaining people who care for me to deal with. When I visualize my death, how it might play out, I imagine coming to a well-reasoned decision that enough has been enough. I walk into the woods, stretch out beneath a big tree under a frigid and starry night, and just let death take me. My body will linger there, slowly melting into the soil, with plants growing up through me, bugs tearing away my flesh. That sounds like a good death to me, if not a poet's death. But with my luck, a Labrador Retriever or some other obnoxious canine breed out for a saunter with her owner will find me, roll in me, then tear off an arm or leg and take it back as a treasure to her owner, who will be horrified. Then all hell will break loose about a body found in the woods under mis mysterious circumstances. Why can't anything be easy? One of the challenges those Philistines who don't believe in Bigfoot make against the existence of such a creature is that not only has no living specimen ever been found, but we've never found one of their corpses either. No lab has ever dragged an unidentifiable gigantic hairy forearm back to the family hunting cabin, for example. But maybe Bigfoot is just culturally better at death than we are, than we have become. Maybe they know the best places in their ecosystem to retreat to when it's time to die. It's possible their rituals for death are more tied to the environment and the giving back to the cycle of life into death into life than ours are. Maybe they simply never made the mistake of retreating to a saccharine, manufactured world disconnected from everything that the universe meant for us to be a part of. That isn't so hard to believe, is it? Reflecting on death is as natural a process as reflecting on conservation. I feel compelled to stress that I'm not really suicidal. 
you just have to be realistic about these things as Logan Nine Fingers, anti-hero of the aforementioned Abercrombie epics, is wont to say. Thinking about it doesn't have to mean actually doing it, does it? I just want to be prepared, plan ahead, expect the worst, and never be disappointed. That's Stoicism 101 right there. Back to my late night reverie. Bucky just burst back into the house as if summoned by the moonlight pouring over the floor. She acts like her arrival is the best possible thing that could have happened. Like being up at 3 a.m. with a maniac dog is exactly where I'd prefer to be. Maybe it is. Maybe her verve for life is enough to keep me excited about mine. Her joy makes me smile, and that is a magical gift. She pauses at the kibble bowl, crunch, 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 then makes a dash down the hall for a drink of water. I lure her back to her kennel, her cabin, with a biscuit. Cheeto, the house chihuahua, stirs just enough to get a piece as well. It's said the lifespan of a Jack Russell Terrier is basically as long as they can last before they kill themselves with their antics. Throwing themselves into life until death answers back. Is that such a bad way to live? I don't think so. It beats sitting in a chair, sullen, waiting for an approaching shadow to forever shudder the moonlight. All right. I hope you liked. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I didn't expect everybody to agree with any with everything he said. I certainly don't. But you know, I think it's good to um, listen to things that we don't necessarily agree with to hear a different point of view. And I really, really enjoyed um, that essay of his, and I hope you did too. So as usual, there's going to be some off the porch segment a little bit of that there's going to be a little bit of the grandsons i just want to thank everybody for watching i really appreciate it it's um as you can see we've been getting some snow here in montana finally finally <laughs> and it's it's getting chilly too so that's a good thing too anyway thank you so much for watching goodbye from northwest montana and i hope i see you next time an update on the ducklings. It looks like we have two males out of five. If you look closely at the black duck right in the center there, you can see that curl, that tight curl on his tail. And then just behind him, that other duck has a tight curl on its tail also. That signifies a male. We actually feel pretty lucky if all we got was two males out of that.
Russell, did you have a good sauna? Yeah. Is it snowing? Yeah. Hi, oh, Dada. We're getting lost. Did you get nice and hot and sweaty? Yeah. Come on, Russ, man. Let's Bye. go.